Hello there, um, this is Andy Edwards from Rain, and um, I thought I'd like to make a little video on um, the 10 albums that basically got me into progressive rock. Now, um, progressive rock as a genre often gets criticised as being pretentious and overblown, for, but for me personally, it was a real eye-opener and a, a, a incredible way of getting into music, which had all these different possibilities and uh, allowed you to think outside the box. So I've always been a huge progressive rock fan. And even in other music I like, I do tend to like um, progressive rock traits in those um, styles of music. So I thought I would come up with the 10 um, albums that got me into progressive rock and explain a little bit about how I got into progressive rock and how it influenced my music and how it's influenced uh, my input into this new band I'm in called Rain, which has a new album called Singularity out in November. And you may be able to spot some of the influences coming from my end that I'm about to go through today. So I have cheated a little bit because um, I've actually included 10 album, uh, sorry, I've actually included 11 albums and not 10. So I'm gonna bring the first two up in first place. Now these are not progressive rock albums. These albums are actually from my mum and dad's record collection. This, these are albums that I grew up with from the year dot listening to. And uh, the first one is Jeff Love. Here we go. Jeff Love and his orchestra plays big war movie themes. Now this album, when I was probably seven years old, was my favourite album. And it's Jeff Love who was the guy behind uh, Manuel, you know, the, those uh, 70s albums. He also would create albums for, which, which label would this be? Um, for EMI, which were his versions of, he'd do like thriller movies or space movies. And this is the one I had, was a big war movie themes. And I think that gave me an ear and a liking towards stuff which was very thematic, very cinematic um, in its sound. Um, I'm not the only person that um, was introduced to a progressive rock or progressive rock ray ways uh, by Jeff Love. You know, in the past I worked with, um, did some work with uh, Rob Reed from Magenta, and he also, it's not this album, uh, but he also was introduced to those sort of ideas through Jeff Love and another album like this. So, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a very formative album for me, as was this. Now, this album here, which is, I'll show you it, this album here, which is Peter Sellers, um, and what's it called? Songs for Swinging Sellers. This is an original copy, so we, this album's probably about 60 years old now. And um, it's, it's basically lots of music routines, comedy sketches, and it was produced by George Martin, pre-Beatles, and he really uses the techniques of the day, late 50s, really incredibly, to stitch all this different stuff together. And you hear, you know, like rock and roll skits, and then you hear comedy sketches, which are like, you know, spoofing sort of um, TV interviews. Um, what's on here? Um, there's like Frank Sinatra skits. And I, and I really enjoyed that. I, I, I enjoyed that it was funny, but I also enjoyed the fact that it took you on a journey and the way it used recording to stitch something together, which is sort of conceptual and, and, and where ideas run through the album. So I think those, these two albums here were very influential on me um, as a musician, as I started to develop. Um, the first music I really got into was New Wave of British Heavy Metal. Um, I, I started playing the drums in 1980 and I got into music around then and it was bands like Saxon and Iron Maiden and Tigers of Pantang, you know, so I was listening to a lot of metal, as it was called then. And um, being into metal, I picked up this album, Moving Pictures by Rush. And of course, that was a game changer, you know. And uh, I really believe R Rush are the great gateway band for musicians. You know, you sort of discover that you like, you know, playing the drums or guitar. And so you start listening to various bands and then you, you get to hear Rush. And Rush is mind-blowing because the musicianship and the conceptualization and the production is so way above anything that you've heard at that time. I didn't know this was progressive rock at the time. I just thought it was rock music. I didn't know what progressive rock was. 
Um, but this album for me became my favourite album. This is my original copy from whenever it came out, which I think is 1981. Here we go. Uh, and this album was really influential on me and I think it, it, it turned my ear towards more complex rock music forms. Um, so yes, Rush. Um, around this time I had I, I, um, got quite a lot of rock albums and singles under, uh, you know, in my ownership. And uh, uh, a guy at school said um, he would bought an album and it was terrible and he couldn't listen to it, but he thought he might like it. He said, it's so weird and strange and I don't like it. And I had a Hawkwind picture disc of Silver Machine and he really wanted it. So I said, well, I'll swap my picture disc f um, for this album and he brought it in. And uh, it was actually the Yes album by Yes. Um, and that album was really interesting for me and I'd never heard anything like it. And, and that was where I really first became aware of the genre of press, progressive rock. And I think within a few, um, you know, months, I'd saved my pocket money up and bought, you know, a lot of the Yes albums. And Yes became my favourite band. Uh, and of course, here we have it. It's not the first Yes album I ever bought, but I think it probably ranks for many people as one of the, the, not just one of the greatest progressive rock albums of all time, but perhaps one of uh, the greatest albums of all time. This is it for me, you know, really, you know, Close to the Edge by Yes is just such an incredible progressive rock album. You know, it's only got three tracks on it, you know, and it's got the, uh, you know, Close to the Edge on side one, taking up the whole side. Um, and it is just so far out, you know, takes you so far out of what the possibilities of rock music can do you know the musicianship is so incredible um, and one of the things that you really become aware of when you listen to yes is the signature sound of everybody in the band so i can remember when i first got my first yes album i actually memorized you know i went home and memorized the names of the musicians on it it's the first time i'd ever done that and the reason was is because everybody on that album sounded so individual i never heard a singer like john anderson with his lyrics and that voice. Chris Squire had, to me, one of the most signature bass sounds I'd ever heard in my life. Um, Bill Bruford was the same, you know, I was listening to drummers like, you know, John Bonham and Ian Pace and Ginger Baker and they all had that sort of heavy, thuddy rock sound. And Bill Bruford was, just did not sound like that at all, you know, with this really high tuned snare, really snappy sound on the kit. And Bruford really was a drummer that for me, made me realise that you could develop your own sound and that you de didn't have to stick with the standard rock sound. You could experiment with sounds. I, I remember um, when I got um, uh, Red by King Crimson with Bruford on uh, and to hear that broken cymbal he had on there and the way he, he didn't go, well, that's a terrible sound, you know, um, th the way he uses that in the compositions um, years later I was doing a drum clinic and Bill Bruford came to see the drum clinic and I asked him about that symbol and he said that he, you know, they arrived in the studio and they found it in the bin and he went oh, and he pulled that out and stuck it on and then it became the signature sound of the kit on the album. So Bruford was really influential and of course, you know, Rick Wakeman on keyboards, you know, bringing that, you know, doing incredible organ solos but not sounding like a jazz or blues player, really pulling from classical music. Um, to create his his sound, um, you know, and and of course Steve Howe. I mean, God, what a guitarist! Uh, you know, Steve Howe's one of the few guitarists that can play, you know, really blazingly fast in legato stuff, play classical stuff, flamenco stuff, slide guitar. Uh, and I, I still feel that today, this day, you know, when people mention the classic rock guitarists from the early seventies, like Jimmy Page, you know, and and Clapton, they miss out Steve Howe and just forget. What a phenomenal player he was, you know. Thing with Yes is that the stuff is really difficult and it's really hard for a musician to get their head around. It's much easier to, to you know, to steal some Clapton licks than it is to steal Steve Howe licks. But, you know, um, Yes, I, I think probably, you know, of the major progressive rock bands, that's my favorite band. Um, this might be a bit contentious, but uh, this is now my book bought very early on uh, and it's Genesis, Three Sides Live. Now. I really wanted to pull out Lamb Lives Down on Broadway and be a proper prog fan, you know, and say this is my favourite Genesis album, which it probably is. But this this was actually the first Genesis album I bought. And I'm glad I did because on this album, it's a collection of live recordings from 1976 to 19. 
81. So it covers the prog stuff. It's got stuff from Lamb Lies Down on. It's got things like um, Fountain of Psalmasis and One for the Vine, uh, Watcher of the Skies. All that's on there. But also you've got like Turn It On and Abacab. So I never had this divide with Genesis. This is the album I loved. And I just took all those songs in in one go. And I did differentiate between Turn It On Again and One for the Vine. They were all brilliant. Um, I think um, Side 3 where they do the in, in the Cage medley is one of the great moments in progressive rock, especially live recorded progressive rock. And Phil Collins and Chester Thompson's drumming on that is just incredible. This also has Bruford on as well, which was a, um, another bonus for me being a huge Bruford fan. Right, the next one I've pulled out is Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Brain Salad Surgery. Um, you know, you start checking out progressive rock bands, you know, you go down the library, there's no internet at the time when I was young, so you had to go down the library and get a rock encyclopedia out and you start going through all the bands. And I bought ELP. Um, I was never a huge fan of ELP. I, I loved um, the Trilogy album, uh, but that was probably my favourite album. But this, of course, was one of the first ELP albums I got. And I think, I, I, I think the thing about this album was the cover. Look at that. It's possibly one of the greatest covers in rock history and the way you can see it opens out here like that you can see um, ELP for me really epitomized what a progressive rock band was all the bad points and the good points um, and I I, um, I I really like this album because it had an epic that was even longer than a side that was very exciting for me um, again, real signature sound in the playing, but the reason I pulled this one out was because of the cover and that sort of imagery that was so strong in progressive rock. You know, the fact that you know you you could go and buy an album like this that was so um, tangible uh, was a big influence on me wanting to make a statement, you know, a musical statement on an album. You know, um, all right. The next one I pulled out again, just to be a little bit different, is UK. Danger Money, right? Uh, UK were a sort of super group progressive rock band formed in the late 70s. They're probably one of the last great progressive rock bands from the late 70s. And, and the first album in the Dead of Night uh, album, uh, or was it just called UK? I can't remember. But the first album is one of the great albums and Alan Holdsworth's solo on In the Dead of Night is one of the great guitar solos of all time. But um, this second incarnation, has got Terry Bozio on drums. And as a young guy, I was Terry Bozio obsessed. And, and, I, and I've pulled this one out because it's a great album. There's really great songs on here. But I really feel that this contains some of the best progressive rock drumming ever, ever made. Um, and on here, there's a track called Carry, Carrying No Cross, um, which is in 15. As a younger drummer, I didn't know it was in 15. I just knew it was very strange rhythmically. 15, of course, can be divided into a, no, a number of different ways. You can divide it into a standard like four, 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 and a three, or you can divide it like five lots of three or three lots of five. And Bozio uses that sort of trick on here. It was one of the first times I'd heard anybody using that sort of um, strange timings that then became so popular in bands like Porcupine Tree and Dream Theater. Uh, and so that was a huge influence on me. So yes, and if you don't know this album, it's a really great album. Um, as you get into progressive rock, you start to discover all sorts of weird and wonderful bands, um, you know, under the radar bands. Um, and I bought a lot of these albums. Some of them could be quite difficult and hard to get into. Uh, but one album that was a huge influence on me was Hatfield and the North. The Rotters Club. And now this is, I brought this one in to really represent that sort of Canterbury scene, the more whimsical, humorous side of progressive rock, you know, that you that you often get with, you know, Soft Machine and Egg and National Health. But this was the album that, for me, that really represented that. And this really goes back to that Peter Sellers album that I pulled out at the start, you know, the, the, the humour that often is in progressive rock and the whimsy and the sort of, um, English um, do-it-yourself attitude that you often get in progressive rock. I like that a lot. You know that um, it's all very complex and sophisticated, but it's it's able 
you know, sometimes to uh, take the mickey out of itself. So yes, The Rotters Club, one of my favourite albums. Um, now here, huge influence on me as a musician. And this is another album which is like a, is a gateway album. Uh, I don't know what into, but it's a gateway album for me into all sorts of lots of weirder music. And I think when dance music came out and bands like a, a lot of electronic bands came out later on, I was able to, to get into those because of this band, which is Gong. Um, I really could have pulled out the whole um, Flying Teapot trilogy, but this was the first album I ever got. I can remember my mate bought this and he said, he rang me up and sort of said, you've got to come and hear this album. And I can remember going over to his house. There's two albums where that happened on this list, actually. Um, and uh, he said, you've got to come and hear this album. And I can remember we put this on. And again, it was so funny, but so heavy and so trippy and so way out. And the idea that this is, this is some sort of psychedelic story that then um, spreads out over... Um, three consecutive albums was absolutely incredible. Gong, absolutely amazing band and really opens the door to like dub reggae and psychedelic music and electronic and minimalism, you know, really incredible band. Um, I was just telling you about my friend um, ringing uh, me up and saying, you know, you've got to buy this album. In, um, in the 80s, being a rock fan, I was really into Steve Vai. I got into Steve Vai and um, his flexible album could easily have been an album that I pulled out on here. In fact, I probably should have put, pulled it out, but I didn't. Uh, so we got into Steve Vai pre Dave Lee Roth. I was reading Steve Vai and we did a bit of research and I found out he played with for a guy called Frank Zappa. And so um, we started to try and search out for Frank Zappa albums. And eventually, you know, one turned up in a shop and my friend bought it. And again, it was the same thing one Saturday morning. He says, you've got to come and hear this. And here it is, Shake Your Booty by Frank Zappa. I'm a huge Frank Zappa fan, you know. Um, and this is, the, you know, they, this is the, one of the first albums I ever heard. You know, incredible virtuosity, incredible compositional skills. Uh, Zappa's an incredible writer of melodies. And he, if you study, in, in, for a lot of progressive rock bands, they're basically stitching different elements together compositionally. They, they'll like do it, you know, you'll have like a song, then a middle bit, and they'll extend it then with some solos. But Zappa is a composer who is in full control of the compositional process. And I think that was a real influence on me, you know, in how to write long tunes. Because Zappa uses so many different methods to write long tunes. But of course, he's funny as well. And I, th I think it's funny that, you know, with progressive rock, it's often seen as being very serious. But a lot of the albums I've pulled out today have a lot of humour on them. So yes, uh, Frank Zappa, big influence. When I was... Uh, uh, um, a, a young, when I was I think about 20, I wrote to Frank Zappa and told him it was my birthday and he actually wrote back and sent me a signed card and he had some badges with happy birthday on and I thought, you know, he seems like a really difficult guy and, you know, and all this, but at the same time, I thought that was a really nice gesture to do that to some fan that he'd never heard of. So, yeah, very Im impressed. Um, when you get into prog, because I'm now on to the last album that I'm going to pull out, when you get into prog, Jazz fusion is always just, a, you know, next door, right? And I think a lot of those early fusion bands, like the Mavish Nuxtra and Weather Report, and, and bands like, uh, you know, albums by like Miles Davis, like Bitches Brew and Eleventh House, all were really proggy as well. They were very influenced by prog. I know Return to Forever, you know, um, acknowledge the influence of prog, and, and I think that Romantic Warrior by um, Return to Forever is one of the great progressive rock albums. If you're a prog fan, you should listen to that. As is this. This is possibly my favourite album of all time. Um, the Mavish Nuxtra, um, Visions of the Emerald Beyond. Look, it opens up in this credible artwork here, as you can see. Can you see that, right? You know, there we go. Absolutely incredible. Uh, and this album is just prog overload. You know, it starts up and all the tra tracks segue together it seems like it's got a choir on it and it's got a string section uh, a section on it it's got a brass section on it interweaved with incredible ensemble playing incredible solos from McGoughlin and uh, John Ponty um, and it has my favorite drummer ever on it which is Narada Michael Walden but it's the way it stitches and flows and the way it moves um, it's got singing on it and the singing is very spiritual 
uh, and I really like that. Uh, I'm not a spiritual person particularly, but I really liked, you know, the statement, you know, when the first track opens up Eternity's Breath and you hear the full choir singing, you know, let me fulfill thine will, and, and, the, and the band just going for it, like, you know, the most heaviest out there stuff. And it starts off at that point and then takes you on a journey, and by the time you get to the last track, which is, um, I think, um, called On, what's it, On My Way Home to Earth? Yeah, On My Way to, uh, Home to Earth which is just an utterly mind-blowing concoction of almost like Coltrane um, electric guitar, you know, overload with an almost orchestral theme running at the same time. And that you, you hear the, the, the sort of the, the free improvisation slowly blending into this huge orchestral finale. It is really one of the great prog albums of all time. Of course, um, once I got into the Mavish Nocturne, that then took me into bands like Weather Report. And I went down, down a very um, uh, jazz-influenced um, part of my development as a musician. You know, when I got into my early 20s, I then rediscovered a lot of the rock music and a lot of the prog. And, uh, you know, and it was it's, it's hard sometimes when, you know, everyone's telling you all that prog's a terrible music genre it's overblown it's pretentious when you love it so much but I, I think there is so much in that genre that it is musically incredible and really influential and I think it's often the influence of prog the influence on prog and on early 80s pop music for example is just undeniable it's it's like and I think that's why so many bands like Kate Bush and 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 the police Genesis yes all had such big hits because when you take all that experimentation and melody and all those ideas and pair them down into three minutes, you start making great pop songs. So I think it's um, an incredible genre. Um, with, the, um, with the band Rain that I formed with uh, my old mate John Jowett and Rob Groke and, and Miron, we've really tried to make a great progressive rock album full of epics and all the stuff that you know prog fans will like so we're very excited to see the release of that and if you like some of the stuff uh, I've shown you today like those albums please check out that when it comes out and uh, again thanks for watching and listening bye